Protestants. Now, if we contextualize Martin Luther and say the Reformation was a good thing, despite the fact that he said, kill and slay the peasants, where will you find them when they followed Thomas Munzer, when he was calling for not just breaking away from the papal authority, but also for rebelling against the monarchies and the dictators that they found themselves in. Martin Luther sided with the tyrants against Munzer and said, kill the peasants wherever you find them. Despite that, I'm prepared to say the Reformation was a good thing. And the reason I'm prepared to say that is that Martin Luther must not be judged by the standards of civilization that we, after an accumulation of thousands of years, have arrived at. He must be judged by the standards of civilization that were around during his time. And that's how society I, evolves. Yeah, and it, we recognize that for every other faith and for every other piece of literature, this yet when it comes to Islam, somehow we want to suspend Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray. what we've learned about that and quote verbatim from texts. Uh, yes, we read things in their context. I mean, you read we Chaucer don't. in context. Chaucer doesn't have followers. He doesn't have 1.4 billion people who believe every. Sorry, I quoted or Martin Luther, believe, not Chaucer. Or are meant to believe everything. I, I suppose Martin Luther does have followers. If you allowed it? me to speak, yeah. I address your Luther point. You'll, yeah. I'll get there. I promise. Right. Um, you don't. We, we don't. You don't have followers of Shakespeare who insist on, or are meant to be insist on, line by line, following everything Shakespeare did and believing everything he wrote. That's because it's literature. Actually, what's happening, Majid, is you're seeing, you've, point, you've put your finger on the problem. Absolutely. It's not us that isn't applying the rigorous critical faculties. We're applying them to the Quran as we would to any other work of literature. You're not because you can't. And and, and the final thing what, on that, if Majid, can't? if Majid, what, what do you mean that if, he can't? He, well, because Maggi knows very well Majid that if he's... Majid is a believer. That and believers are not allowed to contextualize the Sorry, text. Can, I, is that can, true? can I bring you back to my question? What but, about wait, Martin is Luther? That, is that really true? If you were, well, what, if, if you if, are if, allowed if, to contextualize, moment, you would say is, some of the things that right. Muhammad did is crap. If, if you if would the, say uh, some of yeah. the things that Muhammad did is true that you cannot... So you contextualize. Is that true? No, it's not true. Now... Can I say? What do you think of Muhammad many... taking a six-year-old as a bride? What do you okay. think of that? I don't think that's a particularly good idea. However, <laughs> what I would say is that to hear it. there are many, many people in history that have done such a thing. And what we're talking about here is the failure to contextualize actions for the standards of their time. And I'll come back to the point I made, because Douglas, yeah. you didn't address it despite I'm your protestations that you were so. going to. Now let me just ask you again. Martin Luther was a fundamentalist, yes. wasn't he? Absolutely. All Christians now, would agree me, with you that he was right. a fundamentalist. Can I now answer my question? Please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then right. I want to bring this okay. over. If there were currently Lutherans, there are Lutherans around, you meet them occasionally in Scandinavia and so on, very nice, <laughs> very nice it is, and peaceable guys they are by and large. If, however, there was a large proportion of Lutherans somewhere in Scandinavia that started blowing up non-Lutherans, or no, sorry, let's be absolutely right, started massacring peasants, do you think the people would say, hang on a minute, let's not criticize Martin Luther. He did that by the standards of his time. We shouldn't criticize his followers all that much. We shouldn't point out what he said and so on. No, we just say, you know, don't go and massacre peasants. Full stop. It was rubbish at Douglas, the time. It's rubbish the now. It's the same with you're the Quran. You're missing the point. If you're failing to judge... No, let me bring in your... And in fact, what you find common with all of the movements that you're worried about and that I'm worried about and we're all worried about are that they are founded by people who do not have a theological background. Now, for all we think of Al-Azhar and their very conservative views, Sheikh what we Baz. don't find is that Al-Azhar produces the likes of Bin Laden and Hassan al-Banna, or even Maududi, the founder of the Jamaat Islami in the Indian subcontinent. Maududi was a journalist. Sayyid Qutb, the founder of modern-day jihadism, was a literary critic who came to America on a scholarship in the 1950s to study literature. He was not a theologian. So coming back to the point, Why don't please, you name Ayan, a number don't of define scholars who are influential for the whole not. world who a Muslim scholar is. Because actually the people you refer to were not qualified theologians. But don't you? Oh, 15 please, seconds, please, seconds, I promise. Yeah. Um, Majid's uh, trying to imply that the whole extremist problem is a sort of misreading by engineers and literary critics. Unfortunately, that's simply not the case, hasn't been historically in Islam, and isn't now. Um, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who, uh, who Ayan mentioned earlier, was not a self-trained engineer, rich boy like Bin Laden, unfortunately, and managed to hurtle a very <laughs> developed, distinguished culture back in time, in 1979, and hurtled this country back into the state it's currently in under these uh, cloaked dictators. Okay. The Grand Mufti of yeah. Egypt, 
is right, not we, we, a self we see where you're going, and, and yet he talks. And all the other that all Muslims Muslim should go and fight the Israelis. Marjorie, the so, sorry, sorry. But don't we get back to one of the core problems which you still haven't addressed, which is the life of Muhammad and his teachings? Which is as follows, is that if a Christian group decides to go back to the teachings of Christ, you know, the worst stuff they find is the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Uh, um, they can find one verse where Jesus is said, I think the Gospel of St. Matthew, to have said, I come not to bring peace but a sword. But the rest of it is all love thy neighbor and all that sort of stuff. If you're a Christian group looking to go back to the sources of Christianity, you just find a lot of, uh, well, hippie stuff for a lot of modern people. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so what is it about this religion we're talking about tonight that you say is a religion of peace, that when people go back to the origins, they find a founder who was violent teaching violence? His time. So the fact that he referred to, Douglas referred to the fact that he had, uh, that he had a bride that was underage is something which we can now look back on and say, that was an awful practice. But we, just as we look back on, on many things that Romans did and say that was an awful practice, just as we look back on many things that Martin Luther did and said that was an awful practice, but we don't judge these men by right. the standards that we have Let's Today. Bring, let's bring in Douglas no, Murray. No, no, we do, and we should. Um, we should, Majid. And may I say, it's a bit too cutesy to compare a man who raped a nine-year-old girl repeatedly with uh, men being, you know, kind of, you know, the wife's a bit of the you know, master of the household and so on. A bit too cutesy and a bit too much avoiding the issue, which is this. That this is actually a very real concern, which doesn't just apply in mid-7th century Arabia. But today, here and now, in Britain, in my own country, we now have, uh, thanks to, the, uh, to, to an arbitration act put into a law in the 1990s, whereby people can uh, have uh, civil disputes arbitrated uh, under, under laws that they, they, they can decide on, that we now have Sharia courts in Great Britain. And the Sharia courts that in Great Britain are operated by people who are actually uh, clerics. They are um, uh, religious authorities. There's one at the moment, you know, well, Siddiqui in, uh, in, in Leicestershire. Uh, now, uh, now, this man runs a set of Sharia courts. A couple of years ago, it turned out that we, we found out a little bit about the sort of thing he was, he was deciding. And sadly, again, it's not reformist stuff, because when you go back to the Sharia, people take the lessons from it, and they make judgments like the following. Six women, six women who had gone to the Sharia courts because they were being physically abused by their husbands, uh, they were persuaded to drop the cases because this should be a matter between a Muslim woman and her Muslim husband and the Sharia court. This should not be a matter for the police in Great Britain in 2008. That stinks. What's more, there was in another case, a local man, a local Muslim man died. His will was arbitrated by Sharia because that was, that was what happens now in 21st century Britain. And the arbitration of this man's will gave half the inheritance to the daughters as to the sons of the man because that's what you have in the Quran. But so it's all very Mar well to say Mar that it's something you... just actually said that he agrees with you that this stuff needs to yeah, change. Yeah, but the point is, is that when you look at the courts that are doing this, when you look at the religious authorities, <laughs> when you look at the clerics, the judgments they're making, those are the kinds of judgments. I wish that Majid would get some clerics on his side who could set up rival Sharia courts that didn't decide that women were second-class citizens. But sadly, at the moment, that is the case. Also, Dr. Tarah Qadri's fatwa against terrorism. Now, the reason why there aren't uh, many more such examples, though there are uh, quite a few, is because prior to Dr. Tarah Qadri uh, issuing this fatwa, his colleague, who was also from the same way of thinking, was assassinated in Pakistan, was killed by a suicide bomber in a mosque where all the other congregants who were praying were also blown to smithereens because he had the guts to simply give a sermon in that mosque condemning suicide bombings. And so this is why many people are scared because it takes guts, I tell you, to go into Pakistan and try and challenge these extremists. That's a country that doesn't have much rule of law. It's a country that's struggling against the so-called Pakistani Taliban from taking over a third of their country and they're fighting that fight on the front lines and there are those who are brave enough just to give a speech to condemn terrorism and they're blown to smithereens in their mosque um, while praying measured. And, and, and surely they're religious people they were measured. praying in a mosque I'm, Douglas I'm, 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 look, you I'm, did support that fatwa though didn't I, I, you I did it's the only yeah. time I've ever done a book review of a fatwa um, um, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, I'm sorry to say this though, Majid you seem to have just proved our point yes it's am I <laughs> Please explain. Is it, is it, I mean, I, I'm very grateful. It's a very important and very interesting question why more people don't stand up. I much admire Al Qadri for that fatwa, as I have other people who have stood up. But the number of times I've spoken to clerics behind closed doors and so on, and you say, why aren't you saying anything? They, they say, because if I do speak up, I'll be killed. Well, I address you again, ladies and gentlemen, to the motion. No, but, <laughs> hold on. I'm sorry, sorry. Right, ha, ha, hang on, hang on, hang on. How, how on earth? 
How on earth does fear of being killed in Pakistan by a minority faction of extremists prove Islam is not a religion well, of let peace? Let me put it this way. Let I mean, me Douglas, put it this it way takes, then. No, sorry, sorry. I've got to, because really, what you've just said is really quite absurd, and I've got to clarify. It takes one person to kill all of us here. One person in a suicide bombing. Now, if we were scared of saying what we're saying now because of that one person, it doesn't mean all of us love war and hate peace in any way whatsoever. It means we all fear that one person who could walk through that door but, with a suicide bomb but Majid, jacket strapped, but Majid, to, strapped to his if, chest. If we were That's discussing an absurd Quakerism argument, here tonight, does anyone think that when a Quaker said, I'm quite fearful about speaking up against certain things, in my faith, come on, this only happens with Islam. There is no other major faith in the to world true, today Douglas, where it is the case be, that for, people for are that, fearful of addressing religion because they're afraid they'll be killed. It's be only true. Islam. And that, we're saying I'm there's a reason. I'm going to say no. one last thing. The, the, no, no, the, the, no, no. the thing is, you're not the, one, the only one on this panel. I have an Al-Qaeda death threat on my head too because I'm saying what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is that... And I've been attacked in Pakistan physically for saying this. What I'm saying is, enough to extremism, enough to terrorism, let's separate Islam from extremism and disempower the minority of extremists who are trying to hijack a good faith. Douglas, you, Douglas, you've had death threats as well. Minority. So you have also had death threats. For, for sure. I mean, one of the points about this area is everyone gets death threats. Well, I mean, it's just an unfortunate <laughs> thing I think about Jabe this and I are going to leave this I mean, as I say, again, I think, I think it speaks for itself. I hope no one threatens a chair. Just can you read? last point was that... You, it is both, it's not just a religion of peace, it's also a religion of war, and both verses prove okay. that. Okay, but do you want to respond to that, Sabre, or do you want to... I think I'll have to come back. Okay, yeah. Douglas. That is an important one. Ayan and I, and people who, who make some of the points we make, are often accused of taking bits of the Quran out of context. I think you've just seen a very good example of it from the other side. I'm not saying that that isn't a good verse to live one's life by. One cannot just simply quote the verse about there being no compulsion in religion. As and though it doesn't have the other ones either a follow on. It has as a though follow it doesn't so have do a follow on. Ones. And as Ayan has just showed you, as it has a ones. follow on. So I think this gets back to the, the very important question the lady uh, halfway back there uh, made, which is whether or not this can be a religion of peace. I believe it can be. And when I said earlier there are three types of Islam I identified, I said the first one, the scriptures, the life of Muhammad, and so on, bad. Second one, Sharia, interpretations, bad. But thirdly, the way Muslims live their lives today in this country and countries like it. That is our source for hope, and the source of hope for that is that they individually use, uh, like many people do religion, I'm not a religious person, I aren't, isn't either, but we recognize the fact that people of religious faith have the right to that faith, should practice that faith, should have no fear of practicing that faith. There's no problem with this, but it's a private matter, and one which people come to very strange private arrangements about. And I just wanted to add this, which is that if those people are going to be able to reform that faith into the religion of peace you're talking about, then yes, we would be the first people to encourage them. But if we're going to have that debate, as I hope we've shown tonight, it has to start with honesty. Let's it do one more round of questions. It has to start with frankness. We have to I do have to this, this is a very, very complex one, but uh, this has to be said. Uh, Majid's just given the comparison with the Founding Fathers, and there has to be some clarity about this. Yeah. This country rightly reveres your Founding Fathers but you don't think that their word was immutable or unchangeable. Yeah. You don't believe, I don't know, I don't think that anyone in this room who criticized Mr. Jefferson now here tonight will be declared an anti-American apostate who can be fit for slaughter. The problem that our opponents have to address, they have to address this, is that in a religion which is based on the idea that the Quran was dictated direct by God to Muhammad and that therefore if you are criticizing the Quran or throwing out bits or pulling it apart like like most Christians and Jews most Christians and Jews have come to that stage but pretty much you 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 pick a mix with your holy scriptures and it's it's, it's quite a good humane way around it but with Islam if this is the revealed word of God, revealed, it has to be said, as it was shown again earlier tonight, in a particularly obscure and unreadable uh, dialect, uh, which, if it was meant to be understood by the whole of the world, it's a bad place to start. Um, if, if, if this were the case, then, th th as I say, we come back to this problem. The Founding Fathers did, said many great things and did some bad things, but you are not committed as Americans not to criticize the bad things they did. And this is a problem our opponents are going to have to address. We don't think there's a fight between Islam and the West or Islam and civilization or anything else like that. We've made a very clear set of points tonight. And one of those points, which I hope people bear in mind, is we have said repeatedly that it is in Muslims 
and their critical faculties, Muslims and their behavior, Muslims and their faith, that we have hope. And it is in people like you that we have hope for the future. And if the motion were that Islam a century from now could be a religion of peace uh, and people would be quoting uh, Ziba and, uh, and Majid uh, and uh, seminal moments like this and that they had learned from it, well, that would be terrific. But at the moment, tonight, you're being asked to vote on whether Islam is now a religion of peace. Is Islam a religion of peace? I think it is very clear that it is not. This does not mean, of course it doesn't mean, that Muslims are all violent. We would never make that point. We never have made that point. Nor does it mean that there isn't hope in the future. Nor does it mean that we have to have continual clashes till the end of time. But it means we have to start by being honest. We have to be frank about what we see in Islamic history, in Islamic, in Islamic conquests, and in Islamic scripts. We have to be frank about that. In uh, societies which uh, Islam dominated, uh, conquered, and subdued the peoples in the Middle Ages, uh, people who were not Muslims were sometimes allowed to remain in those societies, but they were allowed to do so only by having second-class status, dimmy status. Uh, I would ask you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, not to be dimmies, not to have second-class status, not to vote for things because you think it's polite or because you think you have to say them, but because you think they're true. On that basis, the idea you could vote uh, for the motion tonight is absurd. Islam is palpably, demonstrably, evidently not a religion of peace. I vote against this motion. Thank you. Thank you.